Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about Dynamic NAT. Dynamic NAT uses a pool of what are usually public IP addresses, which are given out on an as-needed, first-come, first-served basis. Dynamic NAT is usually used for internal hosts, which need to connect out to the internet, but they do not accept incoming connections. So looking at our lab again, in the last lecture, we configured a static NAT rule to give int s1, our internal server up in the top left, a fixed permanent public IP address so it could be reached by hosts sending incoming connections in from the internet. In this one, we're going to be doing NAT for our normal desktop PCs that you see down in the bottom left. So they're on the 10.0.2 network. They're just standard desktop PCs, so they never need to accept incoming connections coming in from the internet. Whenever they're communicating with the internet, the traffic is always initiated by them in the outbound direction. They need to accept the return traffic coming back in from the outside, but traffic is never initiated from the outside. So they don't need to have a permanent fixed public IP address. They can just get the next available public IP address as and when they need it. So in our scenario, we've bought the range of public IP addresses 203.0.113.0 slash 28 from the service provider. It's the same scenario again that we used for static NAT. 203.0.113.2 is on the outside interface on R1. 203.0.113.1 is being used by the service provider router on the other side of that link. And we're already using 203.0.113.3 for the static NAT rule that we configured in the last lecture. So that leaves us 203.0.113.4 to 203.0.113.5. The hosts in the 10.0.2.0 slash 24 network do not need to accept incoming connections, like I just explained, but they do need to have that outbound connectivity to the internet, so they do need to have a public IP address when they do that. So we're going to use those remaining addresses, 203.0.113.4.14 for this, and we're going to put them into a pool that are going to be allocated first come, first served whenever a host on the inside sends traffic out to the outside. The first host to send traffic out will be translated to the first address in the pool. That's 203.0.113.4. The second host will get the next address, 203.0.113.5, etc., all the way up to 203.0.113.14 at the end of the pool. Now, with standard dynamic NAT, that we're discussing in this lecture. You need a public IP address for every inside host that needs to communicate with the outside. So for example, if you had 30 hosts on the inside, you would need 30 public IP addresses. If you had 200 hosts, you would need 200 public IP addresses. When all the addresses in the pool have been used with just standard dynamic NAT, new outbound connections from other inside hosts will fail because there's no public IP addresses left to translate them to. So in that case, a host that tried to send traffic out when there was no addresses available, they're all used up, it would have to wait for an existing connection to be torn down and the translation to be released back into the pool before it was able to send traffic out. So it's standard dynamic NAT that we're discussing here is not typically used in the real world. What is used is PAT, Port Address Translation, and I'll cover that next, but you need to understand standard dynamic NAT first, so that's what we're doing here. So our configuration, we need to specify our interfaces again. So we've got IP, we've got interface fast zero slash zero, we say IP NAT outside. We'd actually already done that in the previous lab for static NAT, so we don't need to do it again, the config was already there. 
but our inside hosts are on a different interface than our inside server was. Remember, our inside server was on fast one slash zero. Our desktop hosts are on fast two slash zero. So we need to say interface fast two slash zero IP NAT inside. So for our scenario, we're actually going to end up having two IP NAT inside interfaces. Interface fast one slash zero that faces the server with the static NAT entry and interface fast two slash zero that is facing our desktop PCs that's going to be used for the dynamic entry. That's fine. You can have on all of your interfaces, you can specify outside or inside on there and you can have different interfaces as outside and as inside. So we configure our interfaces. Next up, we need to configure the pool of global addresses that will be available for our hosts. So for that, the command at global config is IP NAT pool, give it a name. Here I've called it flat box, and then the range of addresses. So it's going from 203.0.113.4 to 203.0.113.14. And then net mask for the subnet mask. Well, the subnet mask on our outside interface is 255.255.255.240. So that's what we use here. Next, we create an access list which references the internal IP addresses that we want to translate. Here, we need to identify the hosts on the inside, and it's going to be by their source address, so we can just use a standard ACL here. If you wanted to get more granular than this, you can also use an extended access control list with source and destination addresses. That's a valid configuration as well. But for our configuration here, we'll keep things simple. We can just do a standard ACL. So our command is access list one permit 10.0.2.0 and the well card is 0.0.0.255. So we've specified the pool of addresses. We've specified the hosts that are going to get translated to those addresses. The last thing we need to do is tie them together. So the command to do that is IP NAT inside source. It's a list this time. And list one means use access list one. And then the pool we're going to translate them to is pool flat box. So that's it. That's the complete config to do dynamic NAT when we're not using PAT yet. If we wanted to verify it, it's the same command as before. Show IP NAT translation. In the example output here, you can see that we've got an entry for our inside local. So our inside desktop PC is at 10.0.2.10, and it's been translated to 203.0.113.4, which was the first available address in the pool. And it's sending traffic out to 203.0.113.20. If another host then sent traffic, it would be translated to 203.0.113.5, and we would see an entry for that in the translation table as well. Remember, you need to be quick with this command because entries time out quite quickly. This is a good time to tell you about another couple of show commands for NAT as well, and the clear command here. So clear IP NAT translation can be used to remove translations from the translation table. And that can be useful when troubleshooting. So if you're seeing output that you weren't expecting, you can clear the translations in there and then send the traffic back out again just to double check what's actually happening. It's also re often required if you want to edit your NAT configuration. The router will not allow changes when there are active translations. So if you want to edit it, make sure that all the translations are cleared first or you're going to get an error message if you try to change the configuration. To remove all dynamic translations, it's clear IP NAT translation and then a star. So you can, you can remove just a single specific translation if you want, or you can remove all by using that asterisk wildcard. The other command I wanted to show you was show IP NAT statistics. So this command, we don't use it as often as show IP NAT translation, but this tells us how many addresses have actually been translated. Okay, so that was dynamic NAT. In the next lecture, I'll show you how to configure it with a lab demo. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad-free 
right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.